Hello, my name is Matthew Thompson. Um, I'm doing the interview of John Corcoran, a Vietnam veteran, with the assistance of my camerawoman, Mandy Prosser. It's 12 1902. <laughs> <Okay>. <coughs> Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Um, what year did you enlist? In 1965, April of 1965. Um, did you enlist right here? Or? No, I, I enlisted on uh, Long Island, Bay Shore, New York. Okay, sure. um, do you have any specific reason? or? I was out of, uh, I quit high school and uh, wasn't going anywhere. I figured I'd uh, enlist in the Navy. Um, where were you done after you were enlisted? Um, where were you stationed for boot camp? I went to Great Lakes, Illinois to uh, boot camp, basic training, recruit training they call it. And I think at the time the normal stay was nine weeks, but I, they kept us later, me, because they were looking for volunteers for the drum corps. And what they had to do was wait until they had enough men to form a corps. So I think I was there 16 weeks. What was the name of the, the, um, the uh, camper? Well, it's uh, Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Center. Um, did you have any um, specific training for a special job or? While well, I was in the Navy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was an aircraft mechanic on uh, A-4 Skyhawks. What was it like working on those? It was a, fa a fairly simple plane. I was, uh, my work mostly con uh, concerned the uh, maintenance and upkeep of the aircraft refueling, get it ready for flight, recover it after flight, uh, and get it, get it ready for the next flight. This was on, on the aircraft carriers. And uh, when we weren't on a carrier, we the uh, squadron was uh, stationed at a home base, the Naval Air Station, first we were at Norfolk, Virginia. Then we went to Lamar, California. And the purpose of that was more or less to train the new pilots as they came in because the enlisted men stayed with the squadron anywhere from uh, two to three years. But the pilots rotated all the time. Mm. We'd have pilots would do one tour, which might be a year, and then they'd go on to either another squadron or another duty station. But the enlisted men more or less stayed with the squadron. Mm. So that's what, uh, what we did at uh, when we were ashore. We uh, trained the pilots in. Uh, uh, carrier landings while we were ashore. They flew out, they usually had what they call a carrier qualification, where the pilots would go out, leave, leave the, get the base where we were at, they go out, do their landings, and we were usually ashore maybe three months, and then back on the ship. <laughs> um, when were you shipped off to Vietnam? Uh, how long do you think? 1960. 66, January 66, I think it was. What was your arrival in Vietnam like? Well, uh, we, I was shipboard. We weren't uh, ashore. And uh, we boarded, the must have been boarded, the, the crew boarded the carrier, which is the Von Amershard, at San Diego. And we steamed out, and then the pilots for the aircraft that were. So, uh, we uh, boarded the ship right at San Diego, and uh, first stop was uh, Honolulu. That's where we got our weapons and bombs, a lot of the bombs in the Army and on the, in, in Honolulu. And uh, they gave us a couple of days off in Japan, uh, Yokosuka, Japan, and then, uh, to, uh, then we went to West Pacific, the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, what kind of um, engagements did you um, encounter in uh, the Gulf of Tonkin? Well, what the particular, particular squadron I was with was the uh, A-4 Skyhawk, which was an attack aircraft, and it was a more or less a bomber, mm -hmm. small plane, it carried uh, 
Bollinger well, had uh, two 20 millimeter cannons, and it wasn't a fighter like the larger planes that we had. Although one of our planes shot down a MiG, which was unusual, because the MiG is the size of, it's probably three times the size of the aircraft that we had. So uh, that was it. And we were mostly concerned with the uh, bombing. They had the, uh, I think the guns were more for self-defense, mm -hmm. fights and things if you got in trouble. But uh, we, uh, on that piece of paper I gave you, it gives you the, uh, the amount of the, of the victories on the cruise I was on, the victories and, uh, and the combat losses. Mm -hmm. My particular squadron we had one, two, two of our pilots were shot down and ends up in uh, POW camps. Mm -hmm. And they were released in 1972 or 70, 72, I think it was. Mm -hmm. and I saw it on television. As a matter of fact, it was my commanding officer who was shot down in my plane, the plane that I was in charge of. So he had a pretty rough time. But um, what was it like um, serving on the USS um, Home Richard? It was, like I say, I was uh, on a flight deck. And when we were uh, in flight operations, it was usually a 12 to 14 hour day, depending, uh, night or day, mm -hmm. depending on the mission that, you know, for that particular day. And my particular job was get the aircraft ready for the launch, first launch of the day or evening. Strap the pilot in, we go over the pre flight with him, strap him and get him started. And he taxied up to the catapults and he was launched off the carrier on his mission. And depending on the mission, anywhere from a half an hour to 40 minutes later, they'd come back, change pilots, refuel, re oil, check the plane over, put another pilot in it, and another mission. And that was a constant cycle. Take off finish your mission and recover, land, refuel, rearm, and off you go again. If there's any repairs to be done, they would uh, take them down to the hangar deck, which is one deck below the flight deck. So uh, it was interesting, you had, like I said, it was on a flight deck, it was very dangerous, and to be on your toes. It's a place, it's a hairy place, you could get messed up seriously. I think I told the uh, class when I was here earlier that uh, we had a light night launch and I felt something hit me in the back of the head. <laughs> Pay no attention to it because you, you, you become complacent. That's, you, you could be killed or get killed. And what had happened, this fella had walked into a turning propeller and uh, what I had hit, what that thing in the back of my head was a piece of his jaw. And the only thing left of them that I could see if they went on with the launch, <coughs> I think was his leg. So, and we also had uh, fellas fall overboard, which the deck is 90 feet off the water. Mm. And uh, I think one would be covered, the other fellow, of course, son of a gun, had a bag of tie down chains on his back, which was about 90 pounds. So I think he went right to the bottom. So if you, you know, if you got it, you had, you had to be on your toes and eyes in the back of your head, because you can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Plus we have the ear protectors on. Now, now what they have, this is 30 or 35 years later, they have uh, walkie-talkies. You can speak to the pilot, to the other crew, with earphones back then, which is big earmuffs. So and even them were wearing those, you, you couldn't, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you had to scream. It was more or less all hand signals mm -hmm. between the air, uh, the ground crew was called the plane captain, and the pilot, it was all hand signals, which was more or less standard, like, uh, you know, thumbs up, open the flaps, check the tail, mm -hmm. see you later. <clears throat> Was the um, 
the carrier that you were on, or even both of them, the uh, USS Bonhomme Richard and the USS Independence, Independence yeah. you know, fairly large carriers? The Independence was a uh, forest all class carrier in it. Like I said, it, it had four catapults, the Bonhomme and Richard. It was built uh, during World War II. And that only had two catapults on the bow. The Independence had four, two here and two on an angle deck. So they could launch twice as many aircraft. And what they would do on the uh, earlier ship I was on, well, they were doing it all the time, launch and recover at the same time. You'd have them come, that's why the, the decks were like this. This was the bow, and this is what they call the angle. And you could launch aircraft off the bow on these two catapults here and recover the others on this one here. And if they, what, what the ideal, the, the idea was that they had resting wires and the aircraft had a, a hook, a tail hook, catch a wire, and come to a haul. If they missed the wire, they could just keep going and come around again. So that was unique. Before, shortly, uh, just before World War II, they came out with that design. And I don't know what took them so long, because before that, they just had a straight deck. Mm -hmm. At that plane, missed the wire, a hook, and he was going to hit anything in its way, and it happened quite often. Mm -hmm. And the other ideal thing I said earlier was they could launch and recover air at the same time. Um, did you have any... Um I was going to say that they had a buddy system with the Marines, I know that. But did you have anything, any friends that came from with you from Bayshore or not? No, I think they had that system, but uh, that was only good for basic training, boot camp, mm -hmm. and that was it. You didn't see them after that? Uh, yeah. Well, I didn't, I wasn't, didn't know anybody that was, you know, unless, as a matter of fact, uh, back then, I think it was just individual, this was, they might have had that problem, no, they did, but I enlisted. Singly, you know, not with a group. And uh, who knows? <laughs> Did you have any friends while you were there for your terms or? Your oh terms? yeah, sure. You're real good buddies. Matter of fact, I'm still in touch with one of them. He's in the uh, state of Washington. The last time I heard of him from him, and uh, we've been trying to get a reunion together. Mm -hmm. But see, after 35 years. Matter of fact, I was going to, uh, when I came out, this is 16, 69, I was going to school in New Jersey, in the aircraft mechanics school. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, here's a fellow, I was stationed, same squadron, Nick. Whew, what a shock. So he got together quite often, reminisced. But that wasn't planned. You know. He, had, he was from New Jersey, so that's probably how I bumped into him. That was interesting. Now I have a few loose touch. Yeah, it was a pleasant spot. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, how, I can't remember, here, but how many terms did you serve? One, one enlistment. Just well, one I, yeah, uh, what they had, I enlisted when I was 17. Back then, what they had it was called a minority enlistment if you were under 18. You would be your term would expire. Your enlistment would expire when you turn 21. So I, when I was I was 17 when I enlisted, I was uh, released from active duty. You don't get discharged until the total six years are up. But I was uh, released from active duty on my 21st birthday, and then I uh, used the GI Bill. I finished high school in the Navy. And went to school in New Jersey, and then finished that. Uh, graduated from MV here in Rome. Hmm. So that was the GI Bill, and you, at that time you didn't have to put into it. It was just guaranteed. Of course, it wasn't as much, <coughs> but I suppose the budgets the way they are, the, the Veterans Administration. Uh, but I think these days it's it's even better because they match what you put into it. So. Yeah. What was it like um, when you found out that your term was up, your tour was up, and you're going home? 
I would have thought it would have stayed in. I mean, it stirs up. You can't wait. You can't wait to get out. But in hindsight, should have stayed in. I've been retired. I would have been retired when I was 37, 20 years. Just, you know, and then go to work. Like a lot of while it's being your own here at the Air Force Base, you see a lot of that. Mm. Fellows retire and uh, then, like I say, then go to work. <laughs> So you were you were released and not discharged? Yeah, you know, you're on honorable discharge. Yeah. Uh, after a total of six years, and a normal tour would be four years active and then two years inactive. As a matter, in the, within those two years, you could be recalled. Hmm. So that's the terminating enlistment was a total of six years. Did you have any shore leave? On oh yeah, sure, on? sure. We uh, not not in the Vietnam, no, not, not in the country, no. We would go uh, to Japan in the Philippines. The Philippines was, uh, we were at Subic Bay, there was a naval station there. And up the road a bit was uh, Subic, uh, Clark Air Force Base was in the Philippines. And uh, that was, like I say, Subic Bay was a bustling little city. And we'd stay out maybe 45, 50 days, come in and replenish and rearm the ship, weapons and reload. And we'd be in port maybe three or four days and then uh, go out again. We also visited Hong Kong. We were going to go to Australia, but something, I don't know, something came up, changing orders or, uh, oh, I know what it was. It was the, uh, it's the forest doll. He was his forest doll. Caught fire while we were there. It was supposed to be our relief. Mm -hmm. And uh, so <laughs> we, we uh, had to stay over. Forest doll. That was a, a disaster. It's the worst thing you can have is a fire on a ship, especially on an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. When the uh, Bombs and missiles. Matter of fact, the missiles set the fire off. So that's why we were delayed. That's probably why we didn't get to go to Australia. But we went to Hong Kong, Philippines, Hawaii, Japan. What we did is hit Japan, go to the Japan on the way over, and then on our way back, uh, Japan. And then I don't know that we. No, we went from Japan on the way back, back to Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, and then. To uh, San Diego, and then they sent us the squadron <coughs> back to the East Coast, back to Norfolk, where we came from. And we're on the Independence. That's where the squadron was assigned the Independence. We went out, went to the Mediterranean cruises, and uh, I was on that cruise for four months, and they flew me back to the States to be separated. In the Mediterranean, we visited Spain, Italy, Greece. That's about it. And then I was flew me off the carrier. And that was interesting. To uh, Spain, and then from Spain, we flew across the uh, Atlantic to Newfoundland. And then from Newfoundland, we flew. They flew us to. Uh, Philadelphia, which is as ironic. That was my first duty station, and my last, and that's why I was so they uh, mustered out, at least from active duty in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, how did your family react when, when you got home? Oh, I said it was great. It was great. I'm glad to see me. Family uh, in the interim, while I was uh, on active duty, my my folks moved to Rome. My dad uh, went to work for the state of New York. And uh, so he and my mom and him and my two brothers came to Rome while I was in the Navy. I still have a sister on Long Island. So it was a joyous, joyous occasion. Yeah. Plus the uh, conflict was still going on. It went on for 1972 or three, I think it was. 
So I used to watch it every night on TV. But like I say in the uh, questionnaire there, I saw a commanding officer be released from the POW camp on TV. I can't look so much. Commander Fuller. And he retired as an admiral. He was a command commander when he was shot down, retired as an admiral. That was about it. Great to be back. Yeah. Um, what did it all mean for you, uh, the experience? Well, at the time when I enlisted, who heard of Vietnam? I never heard of it. From boot camp to Philadelphia, still living there in Philadelphia to Mississippi. Then they get orders to this squadron, tax squadron 76. I says, where's that? It's in Vietnam. Oh, I'm going to Vietnam. Well, actually, I did the squadron at that time, like I said, was in California. I met the squadron, and then from there we went out to the ships. But boot camp, who knew? I certainly didn't. I've heard of the place, I mean, because it hadn't really started to build up. It might have, you know, didn't have that many troops in country at that time. And then it started to get, you know, hot and heavy, more and more involved. You learn, then I learned. Going to the Pacific. And what's funny, I put in, when you uh, finish your basic training or boot camp, they ask you where you'd like to go. You know, East Coast, West Coast, where we'd like to be stationed. So I put in for the East Coast, figuring, hey, you know, New Jersey, New York, maybe Virginia. And I got the, I got the far East Coast. Yeah. It was at the uh, West Pacific. That's what they called them, Westpac cruises, West Pacific cruises. So it was uh, enlightening, and uh, I grew up real quick. From a seventeen-year-old kid, I was I was nineteen when I was in over there. Not unlike a lot of uh, fellows in my generation, nineteen was the average age. Uh, lessons to be learned. Um, would you do it again or no? You just do the whole training and going through all the different countries and... Well, sure. Like I said, in hindsight, I would have stayed in. And they would have given me $1,000 reenlistment bonus. I, I got 300 bucks in my pocket. I don't need this $1,000. <laughs> but in hindsight, I'm sure you've heard everyone say this. It would, you know, it's a, it's a good, good career, especially these days. The uh, opportunities that they have and the different fields. And uh, like I said, 20 years, I'd be 30. I would have been 37. Retired and would have been half of my basic pay, depending on how far up the ladder I went. So, can't cry. I was spilled milk. Yeah, it was an experience I don't regret, not one bit.